All right, guys. Uh, welcome to the Battle Fit Life episode five with uh, Ashwin Hoon. Ashwin is India's top grappler, the ADCC India champion. He is a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and the owner and the head coach of Warriors Cove MMA. All right. So, Ashwin, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. How are you doing? All good. So, uh, Ashwin, uh, a little about how you got into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Since India, BJJ is not that popular and it has made a pretty late entry into India. So what has your journey in BJJ be like? How did you get into it? And tell us more about it. Um, I used to watch Bellator back in the day when it used to come on TV early in the morning. And this is before anybody knew about the UFC and any of that. I mean, UFC was still in India not as prevalent as it is now. So I used to watch a lot of Bellator and I would notice that the, the grappling guys are always doing much better than just the strikers. So, so I was waiting for a gym to open in uh, Gurgaon or Delhi that would teach legitimate Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And Jangi Raza at the time came back. It was about 2012 when he came and he started teaching then um, along with Muay Thai and MMA. So I got into it at that point in time, and and once I, I mean, I used to YouTube stuff. I used to YouTube moves and stuff. And then once I had grappling partners and I was getting good at it, um, I just couldn't stop. So this is back in 2012. I was a white belt for like seven years. Then I got my blue belt with four stripes on it immediately, and then I got my purple belt a year after that. So yeah, it's been a while. So you're a white belt for seven years. <laughs> That's so, white belt. Yeah, that, that, that's a far cry from the people who guarantee belts in a year. So, yeah. Oh, because there are people who guarantee <laughs> a blue belt in three months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Been, been yeah. privy to that circus a lot lately. It's, it's, it's hilarious. It's just, I mean, if you're going to sell out the martial art, you might as well do it properly. Becho, becho, belt, becho. <laughs> So, according to you, what is, uh, like, how do you gauge a person is ready for a blue belt? Like, what is the criteria in your terms for a person in BJJ to be a legitimate blue belt? Um, a person in BJJ, for me to be a legitimate blue belt, they have to be able to beat a white belt who is, I would say, 20 kilos heavier than them. So, um, if you can defend yourself in the street against somebody who is 20 kilos heavier than you successfully, comfortably, and you have um, a base amount of wrestling and judo and self-defense skills that you have learned, I will give you your blue belt. Um, and if you do well, it, it doesn't matter if you do well against my blue belts, it doesn't matter how well you do against them. Um, you have to be able to start teaching as well after a point of time. So, if I feel... And I would let you take a class at my academy. I'll give you a blue belt. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know where I heard this from, but uh, it's like every stripe is like an equivalent of 10 kgs. Yeah. So, maybe. So, I, yeah, that, I mean, I've heard that before, but yeah, I mean, that would make a lot of sense. Uh, but the thing is, Grappling for grappling, that makes sense. But if there's strikes involved, it changes a lot yeah, of things. Yeah, yeah. This is pure BJJ. This is pure BJJ. I think pure it BJJ. was. Yeah. Uh, after blue belt, I would say that's very that's, that could be pretty accurate um, because I've I've felt some very light BJJ guys who are black belts and they don't feel their weight at all. It's like there's a truck on you, man. You just can't <laughs> move them. Yeah. That's a pretty cool analogy then. So, um, in India, uh, since India is a very wrestling heavy country, if you actually look at the grassroots level competitions and stuff, uh, how do the wrestlers transition to BJJ and do they have a solid sport foundation for BJJ? Well, the, the, the physical, if the answer to that is wrestlers, yes. In the, in the physical sense, these guys have everything they need 
to make the transition in a mental sense indian wrestlers and their gurujis um is that's where they get held back these guys cannot leave their gurujis and move on forget moving on to bjj they can't move on to mat wrestling to start with so they're sitting in their khadas they're wrestling in the mud to get these guys to get to mat wrestling first is a big transition and then from the mat to submission would be a huge task and so getting these guys mentally to leave that and trust an outsider is that is your main task as a bjj coach so if i were to do this i would probably try and do this at a grassroots level grassroots level but again um, if these you try to get these guys after 18 19 years old it's impossible to get their mindset to change very very difficult yeah yeah some some people have done it but uh, yeah it's very difficult to get them to leave Uh, huh? yeah but again again you will notice um the mindset uh some people i mean they just they can't leave their guruji and they can't leave uh their ways it's tough very tough few exceptions but again that's why you can name the few exceptions i would guess I would yeah guess. exactly exactly very few people are able to get out of that mindset as you rightly pointed out can actually make it to a mat or to any other sport because it's so yeah. ingrained in them exactly i mean um, in fact there's that female wrestler right now uh, ritu fogat she's doing decently at one yeah so that's a prime example um again i'm not surprised it's a woman they open to learning more than uh, most men are most men are absolutely yeah so yeah there you go okay so uh, when it comes to mma okay so mma the progression is always amateur then pro obviously so how does bjj factor in when you're teaching for mma versus teaching bjj for bjj comps it's completely different so um there are some positions where obviously um uh, they're very similar but distance management is a whole different ball game when uh, and it's uh, it's it's your priority when strikes are involved um in fact if i were to teach a grappler uh, i would teach him how to grapple with mma i would i would our main goal is to not even throw a strike from top position because in mma if you go to hit somebody from a top position you create so much so much space they gone so um How, what is the question again how would i get them to yeah like uh, how do i speak? yeah how, how do you differentiate between teaching grappling for mma versus teaching grappling for jiu jitsu like teaching bjj for bjj comps versus teaching bjj for mma comps bjj for mma comps. again so uh my then goal would be to, to start teaching the guy how to wrestle okay so bjj guys don't need to wrestle most of the time unless you even if you're doing an adcc in today's day and age you don't need a lot of wrestle you can pull uh it's the only time you get a negative point i think is in the finals so you can pull throughout the competition you don't know how to rest it doesn't matter uh with mma i do not pull guard i don't recommend that um which is why i would first take the guy and i would teach him how to wrestle from the ground grassroots level then i would teach him how to wrestle up against the cage then i would teach him wrestling defense and then wrestling defense up against the cage then i would teach him how to get out of positions or actually before getting out of positions i would teach him how not to get hit in positions where he is on bottom and then i would teach him how to get out of those positions so by the time i would get to this guy's attacking game it would be several months in mm-hmm. so that's how i mean that's a huge difference when it comes to putting somebody in a cage and putting somebody into a bjj competition i can get somebody ready for a bjj competition in less than a month and teach him one strategy and he can go out there and do very well or she um but teaching somebody how to get into a cage requires a lot of time and they need to have amateur fights before they can turn pro because there are too many elements to control yeah it's ridiculous the elements in bjj are far more controllable and it's a lot easier so uh 
now from bjj mat to mma it gets a little more complicated from mma to a combat scenario or a real life fight scenario how varied is it and then what are the differences in teaching someone a bjj for a self defense or a combat scenario so again like i had mentioned earlier um my blue belts uh they will not struggle in the street um because they know how to wrestle they know how to maintain distance they know basic self defense techniques and they can teach self defense most importantly um the common misconception is that a bjj guy in a street fight will not do as well as um an mma guy but um if you have a world class grappler or oh, forget that if you have a competitive bjj guy and you put them out in a real life scenario you're not going to be able to hit them very well um so if it's a one on one fight um you're going to have a very tough tough day against an educated grappler um having said that if it's an educated mixed martial art fighter uh, and the dude knows how to strike it's like a grown man fighting or a grown woman fighting with a child there's no competition against an mma guy with a bjj guy again like i mentioned there's a misconception that they can't fight people in the street maybe a white belt would get his ass handed to him <laughs> but a blue belt at least my blue belts i i'd like to say can handle themselves and would do well against somebody an attacker in the street but white belts and some blue belts i would mention the guys who buy the belts will again if they go up against a good striker yeah. <laughs> or somebody who knows what they're doing um they're in trouble then again like if you go up against somebody who can strike and is very good and if you even if you're a blue belt you can get your ass handed to you but imagine and hope when you're a purple belt and beyond that you can handle yourself even against a good striker uh oh fuck i forgot the question uh <laughs> yeah because there is a very funny incident when you talked about the belt getting thrashed about this guy who is a self appointed black belt i think you saw this that i shared on facebook this is um uh the major yeah yeah <laughs> the major pain in the <laughs> some guy so from this, bombay he's an honorary major also yeah yeah self appointed self appointed and that right? yeah yeah and that guy major. yeah he calls himself major that's the funny thing and this yeah. guy uh got like subbed some six times within one round by a two stripe white belt from one of the gyms i have trained with and How then this like that? because the guy told us wow so, so this guy is like uh, you are not allowed to train here because you are very aggressive you stick to the basic things that we teach you i'm like <laughs> oh fuck that's just i mean for starters calling yourself a black belt when you're not a black belt is disgraceful calling yourself a major when you're not a major is i would imagine way worse um, but there are shit load of this crap stuff around in the mixed martial arts field and martial arts field and this has always I mean, been so Like, I've always struggled with the karate guys calling themselves BJJ guys and selling BJJ and MMA. They're just teaching karate. Yeah. And uh, there's nothing you can do about it because it's politics. Of course, in our country, you try to play any sport, you try to do anything, and you have guys who are just older than you and been doing it longer, but they're teaching crap. It's ridiculous how I have to. How I have I've actually had incidents of people leaving my gym. and going to the karate gyms and because they handle themselves better against those guys they stay in those gyms and they, they leave oh my mine. <laughs> yeah i mean yeah you can fight a bunch, of, a bunch of white belts i'm sure you can do you do well against them but my white belts at this academy you they going to give you a hard time so some people they ego just can't handle it and they they go to karate and call it mma interesting So, but this is a field which internationally attracts a lot of frauds like yeah. there are websites dedicated to like busting these frauds now dude since the beginning of time we've had people calling themselves tough and when shit hits the fan you see how tough they are so i would say inherently uh, men 
have this issue this uh, uh, this i call them the the small penis i call it the small penis syndrome um, and it exists with every man um, this inherent need to show that they are tougher than the next man uh, so i'm not surprised that men are calling themselves black belts i'm not so, i'm 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 not surprised when I see these things online anymore. And I it used to infuriate me. I used to sit behind my computer and I'd be like, ah, oh, fuck, 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 fuck. I'm spending so much time doing this, 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 and this guy is getting all the attention. But I've I've gotten over that after part of time. I was like, let him have it. It fucking fizzles out after part of time. People realize things, and if I don't want the crowd that is promoting him, I want the crowd that realizes that this guy's a fucking fraud. So. Let it be, man. I don't think you will lie about it anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, better not to let your blood boil about it. They fall to me. What's the reason? Yeah. If he came to my gym, though, <laughs> I, would live stream that. I would live stream that. Yeah, but they would never. They would never. They are so fucking wily and sharp. They will never let that happen. I know of gyms where there are black belts, and the black belt doesn't roll with his students. doesn't train with any of the students so india i mean as in, in india there are a few there's one <laughs> then there is uh, only one right there's only one yeah <laughs> um okay but again so um as a general policy i like to make it a point that if i'm teaching a if a white belt class or if i'm teaching a beginner class i roll and train with my students and i because like um why not if you are a high level belt uh you can do that you should do that and if i don't think you should be a black belt if nobody's ever seen you roll before uh, as, as a general rule <laughs> so i think you're a fraud if you don't roll um and again these these kind of things piss me off um uh, so yeah once again there we go i mean i could list off names of frauds that i have come across but um yeah so they still wouldn't fight me man they still wouldn't fight me i am i'm pretty sure of that because that's the thing with frauds even if you call them out they're not going to show up because they know they have everything to lose and you have nothing to lose they're going to sit there and talk shit back to me on instagram maybe but um, if they were in person they don't even look at me yeah so uh, i've seen a bunch of places uh, in terms of mma uh, at your place uh, you are very pro leg locking games absolutely like right from white belt which is a unique thing obviously uh, absolutely so what got you so into the leg lock game like it could have been anything pushkaraj it could be okay um there are only back attacks in today's day and age and i would be doing that the thing is today's trend is leg locks leg attacks um so i'm doing it um it could have been anything else i'm not like okay i like feet or something i got a foot fetish uh, <laughs> is because, because because the world over in competition is being successful with this that's why i'm applying it uh, i don't want my students to fall behind whether it's at a at a blue belt level or even a white belt level which is why a base system of foot locks is taught to them at the white belt level and then as they get into it even if you if you have a good proficiency over it at the white belt level i start getting advanced with them and uh, the reason being i don't want somebody to come from another country and attack these guys attack their legs and they're like what the fuck is that we don't do foot locks here i don't want to be that gym okay if you're going to sell, call yourself a bjj gym you better be doing everything you can't say we don't do this but we do this you can't do that you can't say no no foot locks no leg lock what the fuck do you mean no leg locks What do you mean no leg locks? You're you're saying you're a BJJ practitioner. No, you do everything. You can't avoid, like Dana says, you can't avoid fifty percent of the fifty percent of your body. Yeah, you have to do it. How can you just avoid? You, how can you just? It's right there. Just fucking do it. You're so worried about injuring yourself. No, if you're in a controlled environment, you're not going to injure yourself, man. Yeah, but that is another thing about being a controlled environment. There are a huge bunch of people who cannot control their aggression while rolling. and that especially below blue belt or just blue belt level absolutely which is why uh, i wouldn't say just blue belt i would say a couple of stripes in um or the guy who yeah maybe maybe the guy who really wants his blue belt yeah yeah uh, and competes 
uh, that's possible. Like, I have known people but, who just yank, yank, yank left, right, and center when they are rolling. Which that's is, possible. But but again, I don't have a problem with that. You can be aggressive as long as you're not injuring people. Yeah, but that's what these guys end up injuring. And if it's a leg lock or a heel hook injury, it's like ouch. If you injure somebody in my gym, and uh, the general rule, if you injure somebody for three months, you're out of the gym for three months, man. Uh, the main focus here is to look after your training partners. So if yeah. you are injuring your training partners, um, we have a problem. Again, when I teach these moves, any move, I would say a kimura is probably more devastating than a footlock, uh, some footlocks, but uh, if I teach these things, they come with precautions. Uh, but the problem is the guys you have to worry about is the guys who are on YouTube all the time coming in and then they come in and then they apply the heel hooks. Uh, which is why as an, as an instructor, or as a teacher of a class, when your guys are rolling, if you can't watch them, you need somebody watching other people. Uh, and I make sure to call these guys out and stop them in time. And again, that's something that I've learned over the years teaching classes. Um, you need to have control of the room you're teaching. Yeah. I, I think I learned that the hard way because we were rolling when I got my neck injury. We were rolling without our instructor present there. We were like, oh, fuck it. Hello, let's do stuff. And I got thrown smack on my neck and ended up with two micro fractures in my cervical. When was so, this? This is school, 10th standard. Oh, in school, okay. Yeah, that's why I still have the neck pain. It, it didn't heal. So what happened is those cracks eventually developed micro osteophytes, which now pinch into my central nerve. Yeah. Wow. And, and that comes from ro rolling <laughs> unsupervised. So that's a school, people. man. I mean, a school teacher, I would not compare myself to a school. So that, I mean, yeah, that can happen. Things happen. The thing is, dude, you can injure yourself playing football. Yeah. Uh, so like. When people say, I don't want to get injured, okay, cool, that's fine, don't get injured. Um, don't go wild, don't go apes, bash it crazy. If you tell me I'm not going to get injured and then proceed to do flying guard poses, <laughs> then you're going to get injured. Yeah. Cool. Okay, uh, so in the comp scene, uh, mm -hmm. like MMA and BJJ, both, currently in India, the comp scene is not that heavy in terms of being crowd pullers or ticket pullers. Right. Right. So what do you think is the issue there or how can we improve on that? Well, uh, for starters, I would say you need to have fighters who actually fight. Um, we, had, we have fighters who don't fight. Um, so if, if I were to pay, let's say, uh, let's say 500 bucks, let's say cheap, let's make it cheap. And I walk into an arena and I drive there and I see two men in a cage staring at each other and shadow boxing from two feet apart, I would be a pissed off guy and you would have lost me as a customer for a long time. Whereas if I were to go in there and I would see a technical exchange ending with a finish or a KO, any kind of finish, a KO, TKO, submission, um, I would be excited. Uh, that's one. Uh, so initially in the UFC's early days when the ultimate fight used to happen, they used and even when fight cards used to happen, there used to be bonuses for finishes, um, which a lot of the leagues and a lot of the leagues that have um, come up in our country have not provided to the fighters. So there's no incentive really of uh, finishing your opponent. There is a winning, so people will inch out the decision. Um, but if you want to see exciting fights and you want to pull crowds, you need you need to give these guys more money. You need to pay them. Uh, if you pay them, you'll have exciting fights. You have exciting fights. You'll have people in the door. Uh, people want to see people fighting. Especially in our country, man. Yeah. Look at the amount of... Anything happens, you have a crowd. I promise you, if you put on exciting fights, people are going to come and watch. So, that brings me to leverage your grappling yeah. competition. So, yeah, so, tell us a bit about leverage. So, uh, leverage is basically um, similar to how what Eddie Bravo did with his EBI, Eddie Bravo Invitational. It's an eight-man tournament and the greatest part about it is we are not giving the seven men who lose anything. 
we are giving the winner absolutely everything. The winner gets 50 Gs and they get a sponsorship from 411 Fightwear. Um, the whole aim again is to give these guys money. And again, like I mentioned, bonuses right now, I am going to be having bonuses, bonuses for different finishes in the tournament. So I'm going to offer these guys cash, cold hard cash for putting on a show and putting on um, crowd pleasing performances. Um, again, I could sit here and give them medals, but nobody's going to perform at a high level and nobody's going to put their body on the line for a medal. For a medal, yeah, do that. You need to pay people, you need to make sure they're taken care of post event, pre event. You can't make them sit in the heat and perform on a blazing mat. You need to treat these guys like athletes and make sure they are your priority, not the fucking crowd. You make sure your athletes are taken care of. I promise you the crowd will come. People will watch. Um, and I want people to come back to this tournament. Uh, as I want my athletes to come back. If these guys come back and they keep performing, the crowd will come. I promise you. Okay. So, very interesting. Let's uh, Moving back to a very basic question. If you were to pick a guy off the street and teach him three submissions from BJJ, what would they be and why? Well, one would be uh, a guillotine, a guillotine choke, because um, most fights, even if they are two boxers fighting, you will notice the front headlock comes into play at some point of time. So I would teach them a guillotine choke and I would teach them a variation which would lock up and which would not require you to go down to the ground. Um, so you could lock it up standing and so a standing front guillotine. Um, second one, let's say I go to the ground by mistake. I would have a triangle choke and I would have a front triangle choke um, so that I can work off my back so that an, somebody who needs something for self-defense um, can work off their back and can finish a fighter when, or uh, finish an attacker when they're off their back. Um, that's two. Number three is by, uh, by some miracle, if they end up on the back of their opponent who's swinging hard at them, I would teach them how to finish a rear naked choke. Um, so, a rear naked choke, I think, is something that I would not want somebody who walked off the street into my gym. Uh, I would not want them to leave the gym without knowing that one. A good one, one of my favorites. Very cool. Okay, so I, I personally am very pro BJJ when it comes to it being an anti bully system, like for kids, because kids will mostly not get into causing severe trauma to the people, other kids they are fighting with. It mostly gets into what is a tussle or a grapple kind of scenario. So I'm very pro BJJ for that reason. Uh, but when you're teaching a kid BJJ, uh, what are the things like you would structure into teaching the kid jiu-jitsu? Well, for starters, I would teach uh, the kid judo till the age of about eight. Eight onwards, I would bring them into BJJ. And um, until the child really matures, I would not teach them any choke holds. Uh, because even by accident, that can get, that can be trouble. It's unnecessary. Um, the main thing with jiu-jitsu is you can teach somebody to control an opponent without actually doing any harm to them. Um, so positional control is again a major thing you need to teach a child. So uh, from bottom, from top, how to avoid damage without damaging an opponent is a priority in terms of uh, teaching kids. So you can't teach be teaching kids fucking um, triangle chokes or rear naked chokes. No, you don't teach kids that. Because at the end of the day, they're kids. Yeah. Uh, they might agree with you and say, I'm not going to use that on anyone, but when shit and hits the when, fan. Yeah, when shit hits the fan, they will use it. Yeah. yeah. So, this, so this actually yeah. happened in our school. So some, somebody just taught us how to choke. And so, I think, yeah, yeah. The choking trend, choking after night study class trend continued for about a month. Till one guy got choked to the point that he got an epileptic fit. And everybody shit bricks that day. <laughs> After that, nobody oh. choked anyone till the end of school. Or at least till I completed oh, 10th standard. Which yeah. is, I mean, yeah. Can you imagine <laughs> what, 
what the parents would tell me if i taught the child how to choke someone this happened <laughs> yeah so yeah i mean um we teach kids how to avoid the fight at all all uh, at all costs but if if shit happens you need to know how to control an opponent without doing serious harm to them and i think that's a priority which is uh, which is overlooked because when people get children to teach they want to show them cool stuff yeah fancy you moves they can show off you want to be the fun instructor that's teaching um, them fun stuff no i don't want to be that i want to be the one making sure the kid is safe at all costs and making sure other kids are safe from this kid yeah um, that's very important i think very cool all right uh, so ashwin any parting words you want to share with all the guys listening into you right now go fucking train when you can man Yeah, uh, just just hoping to get back on the match. Actually, hopefully the lockdown ends fuck, soon. Fuck the match, man! <laughs> do whatever you can, wherever you can. Do what you have to. Run, fucking squat, lift weights. If you have weights, or lift <laughs> fat person, I don't know. Um, <laughs> do what you have to do, uh, and go train. Um, that's it. That's all I can say as a means to make your way out of this thing sane. Um, train some way or the other do something yeah keep moving keep moving all right guys thank you all for listening in uh, do follow him at at the rate ashwin hoon on instagram and at the rate warriors co mma on instagram <laughs> again see you guys stay tuned to project battle fit and we shall hope to keep you entertained and educated with a lot of bunch of interesting interviews that we have lined up thank you so much again ashwin it was a pleasure having thank you on you. board Yeah. Take care. Bye. We are just about building up this channel on YouTube now. All right. So if you have come here from Instagram, Facebook, or my emailers, or because you happen to Google us, please make sure you follow us, you subscribe to us, and you like this video so that we can keep creating such great content for free for all of you guys. All right. There's a lot of trash out there, and we do not intend to be a part of the trash. We only want to create. your genuine content that actually adds value and intelligence and information to your life so make sure you like follow subscribe and share this is pushkar chirke for project battlefit signing out